a very good morning to all of you and uh, good morning to the online uh, students as well uh, last week we had an introduction to the old testament and uh, today we will get into the actual uh, books of the old testament so uh, we would obviously be beginning with genesis uh, but before we get into genesis uh, just a few instructions for everyone for those of us who are here present and also for those of us who are watching online um, as you know all of our class lectures uh, have been posted in uh, youtube so even as our classes go on uh, the lecture would automatically be posted on you on our you know apc bible college uh, youtube site so uh, if you have any doubts you know if if during the lecture you were a little confused about something and you would like to go and listen to it again it is possible so it's not like as if you have missed out on anything okay so even if you feel that i have kind of maybe rushed a bit on something and you didn't quite catch what i was saying you can always go to the youtube link and you can uh, just rewatch that little portion just so that you can gain clarity if you have any doubts uh, because sometimes without realizing it i tend to rush a little uh, so i will try not to do that i have been instructed not to do that and i will try to be slower in my speech but sometimes when the thoughts are running in the head the voice catches up with us with, with that speed you know and it doesn't really help so uh, you can always go to the youtube uh, site and uh, look at the videos which are available there and uh, that actually clarifies a doubt which uh, um i think evangeline had brought up about the ppt slides so actually if you go to the youtube um, you know um, site where our lectures are posted the powerpoint slides are anyway there displayed in the screen so i don't need to again give the ppt to each individual uh, it will already be there in the uh, lecture so um, you can go over there and look at those ppt slides which have been you know displayed uh in case you want to um, you know capture a screenshot for yourself or something in case you you think that particular slide may be helpful to you and you would just like a screenshot of that you can always take uh, those slides um and then uh, another thing which i realized last time when i was teaching um i don't really get a chance to really look at my screen over here uh you know once i get into the flow of the teaching it kind of becomes difficult to see what has been posted in the chat and another thing which i realized is that immediately after the um, session is done i you know i terminate the uh, the the session and uh, so i may miss out on what has been posted over there in the chat so for the online students uh, you know if you could um, post your doubts questions uh, you know anything that you want to say in the stream page of google classroom all right uh, i will make sure that i go through it uh so uh online students who wish to you know uh, say something or want to ask something please put all your uh, you know um questions in the stream page of the google classroom so i will be able to respond to your questions and um, also uh, like i asked last time around 11:40 if someone here in the class could wave at me Uh, so that i would not forget to give you your 10 minutes for any questions that you may have from the book of genesis all right so uh, one of you can wave at me and remind me that time is almost up uh, so uh, having gone through those preliminaries we will actually get to genesis um, now um, last time we were looking at the main divisions into which the old testament is divided so we looked at how the first five books are called the torah which means instruction it's also called the pentateuch because there are five of them and penta in greek means five um what is the other name for the for this category they're also called the books of the law because that is where moses has given all the instructions and law uh, which god has conveyed to the israelites so these are the different uh, terms that are used for these first five books of the um old testament Uh, now um the students here in the class have also received their textbooks so i would touch upon a few things which are there uh, mentioned in your textbook uh, but then um, 
you know we would go beyond that we would be discussing many other things which are not mentioned in that brief uh, write up you know which is there in your uh, book so um, the books of the law uh, is the term generally used for these first five books and it spans over a time period of maybe uh, around 600 years uh, and um, you know right from the time of creation uh, so it extends to a period of about 600 years and it's generally believed that um, Moses is the one who compiles all this information and puts it together regarding what happened during those first 600 years after creation so um, we have many important things mentioned in Genesis uh, you know the term Genesis basically means beginning so it's a book of beginnings and it talks about the beginning of so many things in fact the beginning of the universe itself talks about the beginning of human beings talks about the beginning of the Sabbath because God says that he rested on the rested from his work on the seventh day you have the beginning of the institution of marriage uh, you know where God uh, brings Adam and Eve together uh, we have the we see the beginning of the fall of man and the entry of sin uh, so we see that as well we see the beginning of sacrifices because uh, the Lord uh, kills an animal and clothes Adam and Eve with the skin of uh, of that animal uh, so we we see a lot of beginnings and in your textbook in fact along with the references you have a nice listing so you can actually go to your textbook later and uh, look at the listing of all the beginnings which are mentioned in the book of Genesis now Genesis also talks about four main characters we have Abraham and you have Isaac uh, Jacob and then of course um, Joseph so Genesis basically deals with these main uh, issues now coming to um, the kind of writing that we see in Genesis it's a term which you might have heard of or you might not be familiar with the term it's something called genre or you know um, to put it in simpler uh, terms category um, when we talk about literature when we talk about written works they tend to use this term they, they, they ask what genre of literature is this is the term they use for instance when, you, when you're reading a storybook that would be called uh, the genre of prose okay because it's written in a uh, paragraph form you have paragraph after paragraph and then you have chapters it's just a uh, prose uh, form of writing on the other hand you have poetry and you can very clearly understand the difference between prose and poetry if I were to put a story in front of you and if I were to put a piece of poetry in front of you you would automatically see that there are two different genres one is poetry and the other is prose so what about this book of Genesis what kind of writing does Genesis contain it's mainly what they call as <coughs> I'm so sorry it's mainly what they call narrative history okay it's a narrative in prose form narrative I suppose is a more technical term but you can just say prose so narrative and prose are just basically um, a narration of something something is being explained in uh, long sentences and uh, the sentences add up into paragraphs and then you have the paragraphs adding up into chapters so it's just prose it's basically narrative history and also you have something else in our genesis which is called the genealogies and uh, especially in ancient times genealogy lists were very important you know uh, to trace the lineage who was the original person and from whom did all the descendants come so because for them their ancestry was very important today it does not seem to be as important um, most of us probably would know our great grandparents but beyond that our great great grandparents we may not even know their name so ancestry is not that important now but then uh, in, in uh, earlier times, it was so important for everyone to know from whom you have descended. And uh, so these genealogy lists are uh, given in the book of Genesis and they uh, are considered quite important as well. So uh, if we are talking about the genre of Genesis, it would basically be narrative history and genealogies. These are the two kinds of writings that we see in the 
uh, book of Genesis. Now, it's generally believed that Moses wrote uh, Genesis uh, in the time period of 1450 to 1410 BC. Okay, approximately, uh, they say that he probably would have written it around that time. Um, and uh, some scholars suggest that he probably began to write the book of Genesis while he was still living in the royal court, uh, you know, because he was adopted by that Pharaoh's daughter and he was brought up as one of the princes. So uh, he would have been there um, in the royal court. And of course, he had contact with his people. He had an idea of who he is, what his ancestry is, what his background is. So he knew that he is a Hebrew. He knew that he actually belongs to, to the to the um, you know Hebrew people who are living in the land of Egypt. But he was in the royal court, and he had been trained in the royal court. So he, in fact, he would know how to write out a historical narrative. Um, you know, if I were to ask one of you and say, in the next one hour, please kindly produce the narrative history of, uh, you know, your last five years, you may in fact even wonder how on earth do I write a narrative history. On the other hand, this man Moses had been highly trained and educated in the royal court of Egypt. So he would definitely know how a, uh, a royal uh, um, a narrative or in fact, any narrative history would be written. He would be aware of those things. And it's actually in Acts 7.22 where we see this particular detail regarding Moses, uh, where it says, Moses was educated in all the wisdom of the Egyptians and was um, powerful in speech and action. Okay, So it talks about how Moses was educated in all the wisdom of the Egyptians. Because you know they don't exactly deprive their princes of education. They would give him all of the education. He would he would know everything there is to know. Um, so whatever science and whatever geography and whatever physics and chemistry they were aware of in those times, he would have been educated in all of that, including all of the writing skills and recording skills. So these are things that he would have known and. Um, um, I mean, even as we read this Act 722, it kind of brings to our minds, I know, the words of Moses where he is speaking to the Lord and giving an excuse. And if you remember, what does uh, Moses say to the Lord about his skills? You know, that would be in Exodus 4.10, where he is talking to the Lord and he says, Pardon your servant, Lord. I have never been eloquent, neither in the past nor since you have spoken to your servant. I am slow of speech. And tongue is what he says. But then what does uh, you know uh, history record about him? Because um, Stephen, you know, even as he is speaking uh, about Moses, he says Moses was educated in all the wisdom of the Egyptians and was powerful in speech and action. So here was a highly educated man who lived in the royal court and yet seemed to have a rather inferior opinion about himself. So, I mean, I don't know, maybe the other princes kind of treated him a little badly because he was a Hebrew. You know, his ancestry was a Hebrew ancestry. On the other hand, they were descended from the pharaohs. So maybe, you know, he had a lot of flack in the court. Maybe people, you know, would comment on him. And maybe, um, um, maybe his skills were not as perfect as some of those other royal princes who were getting trained. So maybe it's, it's a result of all these things. So even though this man was a highly educated person, he thinks so low about himself. And he says, Lord, I'm slow of speech and tongue. I have never been eloquent. The word eloquent means someone who can speak fluently and who can uh, express his uh, words in a very uh, powerful way. So he says, I have never been eloquent. On the other hand, history records that he was trained in all of those things. So, you know, even if uh, uh, you are sitting here right now and uh, you don't have a very high opinion of yourself, there are things, circumstances which God has brought into your life, you know, I mean, uh, in the past 20 years or however old you are, God has been working on you. And there are skills which you have developed, which you might not recognize, but the Lord sees those things. So he sees you very differently because you may be thinking only in terms of a formal training in an institution, but 
you know life itself can be a training and the lord allows circumstances in his people's lives which will shape them and mold them and make them ready for the tasks which he has for them so that's something to keep in mind even as we are looking at you know moses the author of genesis um so um in when we look at genesis uh, we see that um there are some 10 specific sections uh all of them beginning with the words these are the generations of now we see that happening in chapter 2 verse 4 we see it again in chapter 5 verse 1 we see it in 6 9 and then uh, in chapter 10 verse 1 11 10 11:27 uh Genesis 25:12 25:19 36:1 finally 37:2 all of these sections they begin with the words these are the generations of that is the way the royal genealogies were recorded in those times uh, and uh, so even if anyone is making any historical records as well they would you know uh, speak in this way and uh, uh, so this is an art of writing which moses would have learned in the royal court because when you look at the egyptian historical records that's the same kind of wording that you see over there all right so uh, these are all the influences that we see the egyptian influence that we see in his writing style now um, we have a chronological record in first kings chapter 6 verse 1 and based on that calculating based on that chronological record you know which is there in first kings 6 1 they generally say that uh, most probably moses would have uh, started you know with the people of israel taking them out he would have done that most probably in 1446 bc around that time so if the exodus the people leaving egypt happened in 1446 uh, then genesis probably would have been written you know um uh, before that uh, no would have been written um yeah after that so that would be 1486 bc so they say that maybe genesis probably was written around 1486 uh, bc so that's according to another um, scholar because earlier we looked at a different date you know which i had picked up from a different book so there's a little difference in what the scholars say regarding the uh, date of when genesis was probably written now just coming uh, to the structure of genesis um chapters 1 to 11 uh talk mainly about creation the fall of man um you have um, the the narrative about the judgment you know through the flood these are all the things that we find in chapters 1 to 11 coming to uh, chapters 11 to uh, 28 and um, let us say 11 to 36 chapters 11 to 36 can be the next major chunk so in chapters 11 uh, to 36 uh, we mainly see about how god chooses abraham and uh, god decides that he is going to create a nation out of abraham uh, through whom all the families of the earth will be blessed and why did god choose abraham specifically uh, through whom he is going to begin a nation because god saw something in abraham a particular uh, character which he probably had not observed in other people because the lord you know clarifies this he comments on this in genesis chapter 18 verses 18 and 19 so if you were to look in genesis 18 18 and 19 uh, and maybe over here in the class we could have one person read out those of you who are online if you could just follow this in your bibles um if someone could read out genesis 18 18 and 19 what does god say about abraham why did god choose abraham through whom to make a nation
God saw something in Abraham. God saw that here is a man who will take the effort to train up his descendants, his, uh, his children, his grandchildren. He would take the effort to train them up in the ways of God. And so specifically, God decided this would be a good person through whom I can create a nation because he will transfer the instructions which I am giving him to his descendants. And uh, we see how important this was in God's eyes. Um, in our current modern culture, for some really uh, bad reason, men don't seem to think that they have any kind of role to play in you know, spiritual instruction, in disciplining their children and bringing them up in the things of God. And they think, oh, the wife will do it. But that is not how God ever viewed it. It is as the head of the family, as the leader of the family, it is very much the man's responsibility to bring up his children in the ways of God, to train them, teach them, uh, you know, uh, what the Lord is conveying. And uh, uh, so it is definitely even the mother's responsibility, but the father should not shirk his responsibility. God specifically chose Abraham for this purpose. He chose him and made a nation out of him because he said, here is a man who will direct his children and he will direct his household to keep the way of the Lord, you know, is what God says. And so uh, in God's eyes, the, this particular role of a man is very important, not something to be neglected. It is good to go and earn money and get rich, but training the children in the ways of God is something that is very valuable in God's eyes. So anyway, that was just something, uh, an aside. But then coming back to the third uh, main section, we talked about how the second section can be chapters 11 to 36, where the focus is mainly on God choosing Abraham and uh, preparing uh, the nation. Chapters 37 to 50 is where you see, um, you know, uh, Joseph's story and we see all the uh, trials that uh, the family went through. And we see that the, that these early, uh, you know, four generations, they did make a lot of mistakes. They did fail in many ways. But what we see over here in these chapters is that God stays faithful. God helps them come out of their failures. God, uh, you know, supports those who have fallen into hard times. God never lets go. So in these chapters, we not only see the early history of uh, the patriarchs, you know, as they are known, the uh, Abraham, Isaac, uh, Jacob, and Joseph are generally called the patriarchs. The patriarch is a very old word, which basically means the fathers, you know, the forefathers. So... Uh, um, even though the patriarchs were not always perfect, even though they failed, even though they made mistakes, God was always there to support them, back them up, help them. You know, uh, so we see the faithfulness of God and the power of God in in uh, turning situations around. You know, in these chapters. Now, one uh, unique feature that we would find in <laughs> in the book of Genesis uh, would be regarding the Abrahamic covenant. Um, now, there are three unconditional covenants in the Old Testament. And the Abrahamic covenant is the first one of them, where God does not add any conditions and say, if you do this, 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 only then I will do this. So there's no conditions attached. It's just unconditional. The Lord from his side says, I will do this for you. So uh, the first of these is the Abrahamic covenant which is mentioned in our Genesis. The other two come later on. Uh, one would be the Davidic covenant. And then, of course, we have the uh, new covenant, you know, in the in the New Testament, which is mentioned even in Jeremiah. So um, that could be one important feature to, you know, uh, focus on in, um, um, in the book of Genesis, the Abrahamic covenant. Um, and then in your textbook, there's a brief reference to, uh, you know, how Genesis compares with the other books of the Bible. And um, uh, I'm just touching upon the comparison that they have made between um, Genesis and the book of John and 1st John. It's a nice comment. You know, they say that Genesis begins with the creation. On the other hand, John and 1st John, they begin before the creation itself. 
in the beginning even before creation even came into being the word was already there uh, you know the, the the word who is jesus and of course uh, god the father so we see that even before creation uh, whatever took place that is is touched upon in john and first john and uh, at the end of each chapter in your um, in your textbook you see that Uh, subheading which says shadow of christ now this is again a term which some of you would be familiar with but for some of you this term shadow of christ what on earth do you mean by shadow of christ uh, you know this is not some new ritual that someone is trying to come up with about shadows and stuff it's just basically saying uh, is jesus christ represented in some way in these old testament books because in the old testament books it doesn't really talk about jesus but is he represented in some way in these old testament books so in that sense they're talking about uh, a shadow of christ so we don't really see jesus being mentioned but there may be a, a slight reference to him there may be a shadow of christ seen in these old testament uh, books so um one very interesting shadow or representation of christ that we see in the book of genesis would be melkizedek now uh, scholars have been debating about melkizedek for ages some say uh, he was not even human uh, he he must have been jesus himself uh, who came down in earthly form and met with abraham um, that kind of really does terrible things to the doctrine uh, because you know we know that jesus came down in human flesh you know when he was born uh, in the old in the new testament so uh that is one uh, you know um theory which they have about melkizedek and there are others who say uh, he he must have been a very godly ruler and so he uh, and moreover it says over there in genesis 14 18 uh, that this man was like a high priest to the lord so he was not only a king he also performed a high priestly role where he was genuinely following and serving yahweh so uh, they say that um jesus um that this melkizedek resembles jesus in the way that in the same way in the new testament jesus becomes a high priest in the old testament this man melkizedek must have been like jesus he was a very godly high priest who was serving the lord and also pointing people towards the true god so um uh, in hebrews 7 uh, 1 2 3 you have reference of melkizedek and if you look if you look specifically at hebrews chapter 7 verse 3 and um, this is this a term used over there resembling the son of god so it does not say that melkizedek was the son of god it says that he resembled he was like the son of god okay so melkizedek was probably just a human being uh, but a very godly human being who was also a king and a high priest and uh, because of his uh, because of who he is uh, god instructs abraham to give uh, one tenth as a tithe to this person and uh, that becomes like a shadow of what jesus will do for us in the new testament where he would become a high priest and intercede for us with the father so uh, that can be one main shadow or representation of jesus christ in the book of genesis there are of course many others mentioned in your uh, textbook now uh, there's another uh, important um, and interesting point that i would like to bring um, i was kind of debating over this whether to mention it at all or not but then this is something that i found very fascinating about the old testament and i thought i would just share it with you uh, now um, if you don't quite get it that's okay uh but um, this is something that we find throughout the old testament it's a kind of writing style which they had in those days in the ancient near east uh in the literature of that time we see this particular kind of uh, a writing format um what we use today in our writing is actually the greek form of writing you know when you were in your third standard fourth standard uh, and you had to sit in your english class and the teacher is teaching you how to write an essay she would say to you she would say you have to have an introduction where you're going to tell this is what my essay is going to be about 
and then you will come to the body of the essay where you will give your main content and you will talk about all that you want to say and then you must have a conclusion is what the teacher would say where you are going to summarize all your main points and you are going to give one concluding statement about this is what my essay is is concluding about you know so something of the sort now this is a greek way of thinking and a greek way of writing the people in the ancient near east back then in those days they had a interesting writing style uh, which was uh, technically referred to as the chiasms c h i a s m s so i will just kind of you know take you to a um, powerpoint slide which will help you to better understand what i'm talking about and um, uh, these chiasms are very very um, interesting because the old testament and in fact even the new testament is filled with them and they are trying to bring the whenever the author would try to write in this chiastic form he's trying to bring out something very significant he's trying to make a very important point uh, so it helps us if we are aware of this thing because then we can go online and maybe read up about it and find out more about it because wherever you have a chiasm in the old testament and in the new testament the author is using that particular writing style to convey something very significant and uh, so i'll just take you now to the slide and maybe we could we could look at that okay i'm uh, assuming that it's uh, you know the slide is visible to even the online students um okay it would be visible right to the online students perfect yeah thank you all right uh, now uh, one of the most uh, one of the first and most interesting chiasms in the old testament would be the story of noah and if you look at the way the story of noah is written you would get a clear idea of what exactly is a chiasm they would write using something called a mirror structure oh it's not showing up here is it what would i need to do okay um we will uh, i will convey this to the class uh, the physical class here later so sorry i had not even thought about that um yeah sorry uh, okay those of you who are online and who are able to see uh, on your screens what is being um, said the rest of you would have to use your imagination a little bit uh, you know the the story of noah begins with uh, genesis chapter 6 um and this chiasm actually begins with genesis chapter 6 verses 11 to 13 okay where it talks about how god decides that the world has become so evil that he must destroy it and then if you come down to the very ending of this entire noah uh, passage uh, that would be in your uh, genesis chapter 8 verses 21 to 22 um you would see a parallel a similarity between this first layer of the story and the last layer of the story they are similar in the first layer of the story god decides i will destroy this world because of the evil there is and if you come down to the last layer of the story you know when god has made a covenant with noah he says i will never again do it so in the first layer you see god deciding to destroy in the last layer you see god saying no never again will i do this thing coming down to the next layer okay the next two layers um in in this layer which would be chapter 6 verse 14 to 22 noah he builds an ark come right down to the bottom and you have the second last layer down below that would be um i'm not able to see because of the you know i have this window over here which i'm not able to get the reference but then we see that noah he builds an altar so in the second layer of the story right on top you have noah building an ark if you come down to the second last layer over here you see noah building an altar 
then you come down to the third layer third layer okay so over here you have uh, the lord ordering them to enter the ark and if you come down here you have the lord uh, ordering them to leave the ark so it's like a mirror structure whatever you have in the first layer here matches with the last layer here second last layer uh, th the second layer and the second last layer again match it's like a mirror structure whatever is there reflects whatever is over here and why were they writing in this style you see they were leading up to the center point what you actually call the x the chiasm actually is a greek word and the x the the chias i think was the word i don't remember my greek word but you know the center is the x and there a very very significant thing will be said and we see this happening again and again in the old testament passages where at the very center of this chiastic structure god says something significant and uh, over here in this particular passage that would actually turn out to be uh, ch um, chapter 8 verse 1 where it says god remembered noah now why on earth would it say something like that can god ever forget anything god remembers everything always but that wording has been put over there specifically for you and me you know for the readers to know that in spite of all that has been happening in the story god never forgets his people his eyes were always on noah and his family in fact if we were to go to acts um chip now sorry if we if we were to go to genesis chapter 8 verse 1 over there it says but god remembered noah and all the wild animals and the livestock that were with him in the ark and he sent a wind over the earth and the waters receded so um if you look at this story there's a lot of violence happening here there's destruction there's god's anger and judgment and all of that happening but if you look at the center of that story right there in the middle it says god remembered noah not that god ever forgot but the point over there is being made for you and me to understand it's emphasizing the fact that the lord never forgets his people so irrespective of what floods what trials what things are happening in our lives we can have this one confidence that the lord always remembers his people his eyes are upon his people and not just that it says over here he not only does he remember noah it says he remembered all the wild animals and the livestock so in the midst of this passage this narrative which talking about anger and judgment and violence at the center of it you have this phrase which talks about the mercy of god the compassion of god because god never wreaked out this entire havoc just to bring destruction he did it to bring about new hope a new beginning because the world had gotten to such a rotten state that the lord wanted to restore and redeem and re restart something new give people a second chance give mankind a second chance and we see that because of that this particular phrase is uh, is placed right in the middle of the chiastic structure so um even if you're going you know, to go into the internet and you look for you know chias chiasms and if you if you just simply type in google chiasms in the old testament and you start looking at them look at what is there in the center even as the story starts coming right to the middle we start noticing that it that it becomes significant and in fact you will have some commentaries which will explain in what way that particular middle portion is significant so uh, that's just something that i wanted to you know bring our attention to even as we are doing this old testament survey um all right we will um, now maybe get into a very brief overview of um, some main uh, you know concepts with which are there in genesis um the first is just something which people are, it's an uh, a question which some people raise uh, and they say uh, you know you have the, you have a um a description of creation in chapter 1 in genesis chapter 1 you have a, a, a description of creation but then in chapter 2 you have another second description of creation and so they say what is this is it like two different writers writing two different versions are they really contradicting each other and they come up with all of these questions but then if we look we will see that chapter 1 uh, just gives a brief introduction of giving a list a brief list of all the things which were created okay that would be in chapter 1 
chapter 2 is attempting to provide you more details regarding some of the things mentioned in that list okay so there's no contradiction between chapter 1 and chapter 2 chapter 1 is just giving an outline this 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 these are the list of things which were created chapter 2 tries to give you extra details about some of those created things for instance in chapter 1 you just it just simply says that god created humans in his image but then when we go to the second chapter we discover something about how they were created god physically gets uh, involved in it because he chooses to take up uh the the dust of the ground and make humans out of it so this uh, he doesn't just speak it out he actually uh, acts upon it gets involved in it so we see details in the second chapter which uh, are not mentioned in the first chapter so they are not two contradictory versions of creation uh, it's just that the second chapter is trying to provide greater detail regarding the uh, first chapter now what do we mean when we say that humans were made in the image of god um um did i say something wrong okay uh, yeah yeah um okay uh, it's the hand waving time yes okay so we have just 10 minutes left let me just fit in this thing about you know the made in the image of god um as we all know i mean god is a spirit being uh, so it's not that he has two hands and two legs and is restricted to one body you know he is everywhere so um, when it says that humans were created in god's image we are, we are not trying to say that god has a human body uh, like us rather we are similar to the lord in uh, three ways humans were given the same moral um, feature that god has whatever god regards as right and wrong humans also were created to feel the same way they too would feel the same way god does about what is right and what is wrong now because of the fall and because of sin now people's um um pe pe people's people's perspective has become very warped we have different people saying ah no no this is good and then others say no 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 this is evil and this they see there seems to be no consensus on what is good and what is bad but when god first created humans they had the same moral um character that god does whatever god regards as good and evil humans also regarded the same very same things as good and evil and the second thing is that like god humans also have this spiritual aspect to them they are able to communicate with god they are able to understand god they are able to uh, to to understand these divine things which plants and animals are unable to understand so we have a spirit so in that sense we are created in the image of god and third we have an intellectual nature which no other creation uh, you know uh, no other part of creation has we are able to think we are able to analyze uh, we are able to um, to remember what has happened in the past and relate it to someone all these things no animal no plant is able to do so when it comes to the moral aspect the spiritual aspect and the intellectual nature in these three areas we have been created in the image of god uh, all right so um, um that was just something that i wanted to um, mention and yes uh, if anyone has any questions here in the class you could maybe raise it up anything from the book of genesis hopefully nothing too technical if it is too technical for me to handle i will look it up i will find out the needed information and i can share that with you next class uh, but whatever i do know i can you know answer those questions right now so those of you who are online i'm very sorry uh, but you know if you could um, put your questions immediately after the class maybe in the stream page i will go through the questions and all of those questions shall be addressed in the next class we will not get into very controversial issues or lengthy debates because genesis can generate a lot of debate but anything that can be answered in a simple manner we will do that because you know uh, we have to go through the all the books of the old testament and we may not have time to deal with it but anything that all that you know that you want to raise right now any question that you want to raise regarding the book of genesis any questions yes your time <laughs> okay the question which was asked by one of the students here uh, was that um, um 
what do we say about the days of creation because of the debate which is there some people say god literally created in uh, you know uh, seven days uh, in six days sorry in six days you know 24 hour time span and then there are some who say no 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 uh, when 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 it says day it doesn't talk about an actual physical 24 hour day it's talking about many many thousands of years and so there's a lot of debate regarding this and uh, even today the top scholars are still debating it and i am no top scholar i will just give you a very brief idea you know regarding this uh, this whole thing just so that you have an idea of what people are saying regarding this the word that is used over there in your hebrew bible is the word yom okay yom is the word for day now yom can be used for day yom can also be for duration so the hebrew vocabulary was rather limited in the sense they would use one word with many uh, many different um, meanings layers of meaning so yom would be used for a physical actual 24 hour day yom would also be used for a duration of time so in what sense was it mentioned in genesis chapter 1 now uh, that we don't have much clarity regarding so there are two main parties generally so there are those who will say yom actually is talking about a long duration of time and uh, so uh, it kind of matches with what evolutionists talk about today about how you know um, each um, you know uh, there were there were different ages you know and then um, different species came into being during each of those uh, phases and so uh, people who support uh, this idea of yom being a long duration of time they say see the bible is or uh, is also saying what these people evolutionists are saying uh, each day was actually a long duration of many thousands of years and gradually things begin began to come into existence during that time as god created them uh, the one main argument which the other party has you know those who hold on to the idea that it's just literally physically physical 24 hour duration uh, they say that you know if you are going to match your uh, thinking with the evolutionists it's going to have a problem because the because of the order in which the creation happened on day one certain things were created day two certain things were created and if you look at evolution they will give you a different ordering of creation for instance the sun and, uh, and, and the moon and all were not created on day one on the other hand the evolutionist you know who talks about how there was a, just a big bang and then uh, you know the stars began to come so which means if stars began to come even sun also would have had to come at that particular time uh, so but then again the other party the other side they argue and say oh, okay fine maybe the other stars were coming into being but on the fourth day is when fourth duration of time is when god allowed the sun to form to take form so it goes back and forth and you have uh, and probably an entire 10 percent of the internet is just devoted to that there's a lot of debate on it okay but this is the main thing so you have people who say that the word yom is just 24 hours literal day and the others who say it's a long duration of time um and uh, we do not really know uh, uh you will have to form your own opinion regarding that yeah anything um else any other question the second you want just those three things those three aspects uh yeah uh the question uh, which one of the students is asking is uh in what way were we created in the image of god in the moral aspect as in what we regard as right and wrong uh the spiritual aspect where we are able to understand god and communicate with god and the third aspect is intellectual, where we are able to reflect upon things, we're able to analyze them, we're able to talk about it in a logical manner, all of these things. So those would be the three aspects uh, in which we are similar to the uh, image of God. Yeah. Anything else at all? Yes. Hmm. 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 yeah that 
again that's a very it's a very debatable thing and um, okay do we really have time for it even um, it, it's called the gap theory so the the theory says that verse 1 is talking about how god created and then uh, there was a long gap of maybe millions of years and then verse 2 happened god began to this whole process of creation so they tried to adjust and uh, say you know science is today suggesting that it would have taken this many millions of years for everything to form so yes even the bible is also saying that because there's a long gap between verse 1 and verse 2 or verse 1 is when god created uh, the the heavens and the earth but then after that the actual creation of all the other things would have started much later and there was a long gap which took place between one and two and then of course they would also get into all kinds of doctrinal issues about the fall of uh, satan and all the and all that let's not even go there at the moment uh, yeah okay uh, yeah we'll we'll conclude with your question because it's time go ahead God did not feel the okay. The what the student is saying over here in the class is that um, you know God being God doesn't need to explain uh, to us uh, you know uh, how exactly He went about creating, and um, yeah. Mm. Mm. Yeah, God being on a different level than us, um, for him, nothing is impossible. So he could have adopted any means of bringing about the creation. Uh, he was not restricted by uh, uh, time the way we are, uh, is what the student is uh, saying. And um, what was the question? You just wanted to say that. Yes. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. All right. Yeah. So uh, the bell has rung over here and we need to conclude. So thank you very much. And next uh, tomorrow, yeah, we will be meeting for Exodus. Thank you. And thank you all.